Hi, and welcome to today's CBF conversation. Today, we're talking about extending hope and hospitality by breathing new life into giving. We are glad that you have chosen to be with us on this beautiful autumn day. I'm glad to also have my friends with me, colleagues in ministry, Stephen Porter, who serves as our coordinator for global missions, Xiao Chen Caps, who's our financial officer and development director for Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, and Janae Angel, who serves as our field personnel in Belgium. Each of them will introduce themselves a little bit more, and uh, we'll get started with our program. And again, thank you for joining us today. Stephen? Well, it's great to see you all today joining us on this conversation about mission giving. And I do serve as the coordinator of Global Missions, and I'm very excited to share with you. Uh, having been uh, field personnel with CBF many years ago, I can tell you the impact that the offering for Global Missions made personally in uh, my life and in the ministry that I helped lead uh, with an incredible group of people in Miami uh, was life-changing. Uh, not only for us, the chance to be changed by working in mission, but also uh, for, for those in the community we serve. So uh, I'm an exceptionally excited and eager advocate of the offering for global missions, and I'm really great, grateful to have such wonderful colleagues on this conversation today. Xiao Chen. Hi, everyone. My name is Xiao Chen Caps. I'm the uh, president of the CBF Foundation and also uh, CBF's chief development officer. And um, I'm super excited to be here today and we'll be uh, sharing some really helpful um, resources for churches in um, promoting their OGM giving and also hopefully be able to provide some uh, practical tips on how to do a successful OGM campaign. And um, I'm, uh, incidentally, I'm myself in terms of my own journey, um, this is uh, personal to me too, because I am actually a product of the work of, the good work of missionaries um, in, uh, across the globe. And um, would love to be able to share a little bit about that too later, but I'm excited to be part of this conversation and excited to be able to contribute to energize uh, our churches and um, in their promotion of um, the OGM, CBF's OGM giving campaign. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Janae? Hi, I'm Janae Angel and I am CBF field personnel serving in Antwerp, Belgium. Um, I've been here for more than 17 years now, which is a really long time and it's gone by so quickly all at the same time. I'm married to Hari, who is an Assyrian evangelist from Syria. So that's a little mouthful as well. And we have two daughters. Phoebe just turned 10 last week and Maria Grace will turn six in December. And so as a family, we are recipients of the offering for global missions that keep our presence here, my presence here. And so I'll share a little bit more about that later as well. But the offering that allows us to work with the Arab speaking population here and they are so hospitality driven. So that offering also allows us to be hospitable and share that hospitality of Jesus with so many different nations. Great. Thank you all so very much. And I'm Ellen Seacrest and I serve as the manager of global mission engagement for the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. I've been in this role for a little over a year and a half and I come uh, from the local congregation where I've served as mostly as a youth minister and children's minister, but also as uh, the spiritual formation and missions leader. Uh, minister for congregations and uh, I served in the local church for 30 years. So I uh, Come, come with some of that experience. And I refer to us often as the pew sitters uh, in our work with CBF and uh, what the congregation, uh, what would be advantageous for congregations and ministers in general, especially when we're trying to lead mission efforts, particularly around trying to raise money uh, for our field personnel, for the mission partnerships that we offer uh, through the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. So Stephen, if you'll give us a little overview of global missions and um, some of the work that we actually do um, through our office and around the world, please. Sure. Thank you so much, Ellen. And I'm just delighted to be here with Xiao Chen and Janae, especially. Um, each year, our offering for global missions campaign features um, usually two field personnel, one domestic 
um, and one uh, international. And Janae is, is the feature, uh, the international focus this year in our materials. So if you look uh, at some of the resources that Xiao Chen is going to, to share uh, a little bit later that you can find on our website at cbf.net uh, backslash OGM, um, you will see Janae featured prominently and uh, some wonderful videos, powerful videos, Bible stories, and other things. But I'll let uh, Xiao Qin uh, share some of that later. Um, we, as Cooperative Baptists, are part of a long history of cooperative mission funding efforts uh, and cooperative mission efforts just in general. We trace our history really back to the beginning of the modern missionary movement. Um, some of you may have heard of the British Baptist um, William Carey, who in 1796 wrote an important tract um, called An Inquiry into the Obligations of Christians to, and it goes on for 25 words because he was a Victorian and they like long titles. Uh, but uh, if you go and you read that tract, it was really interesting proposal. It was revolutionary for a few reasons. One of the reasons was it reclaimed the Great Commission, which had been uh, dormant for a long time uh, in terms of uh, motivating or animating texts for uh, Christian communities. And so Matthew 28, uh, 18 through 20, uh, really became popular due to Carey's writing, where he offered a, a theological or biblical rationale for why we should engage in world mission. He also did uh, a kind of a rudimentary study of demographics, of world populations, and other uh, religious traditions. It was really the first kind of research of its kind that pioneered an entire new field that is not uh, known necessarily as Christian these days, but demography in that way was unique in that time uh, to Carey's writings. But he also proposed, this is really, really rev revolutionary, he proposed a new way of funding uh, missions at the time. Um, and so uh, that uh, more cooperative money uh, model um, called the Voluntary Society was actually based in a moment in British life in mercantile formations of companies. And so he asked, in a sense, uh, people to buy a share from the churches uh, in the, the, the work of global missions. And so um, the mission models that many of us inherited of a common cooperative mission um, uh, offering really find it, their roots back in the late um, 18th century with William Carey. And so as you, you move forward, I remember Carolyn Weatherford Crumpler, who was a, an important leader of the Women's Missionary Union in the last century, uh, and a supporter of the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. In a stirring speech she once gave, she talked about people being, some being called to go, but others being called to pray and others still being called to give. And so we all participate in God's mission, even though we have different roles to play. Janae and Hari couldn't do their work were it not for people here, uh, what did you say, Ellen, the pew sitters? <laughs> the people in the pews supporting that work because God has blessed us with resources to do that work. I give to the offering for global missions. I hope you will too. And uh, we'll probably ask you about a dozen times today in different ways to give to support the offering for global missions. But it goes back to that fundamental commitment that God calls all of us in our baptism to serve as missionaries. But how we do that, what role we take on differs um, according to our gifts. Just like Paul describes, the body has many different members with different gifts, but we all work together toward a common mission. And so uh, CBF is part of that cooperative approach to missions. And when we engage in mission at, at Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, we usually talk about it through our mission distinctives. We talk about three commitments. Uh, we talk about the commitment to cultivate beloved community and the commitment to bear witness to Jesus Christ and the commitment to seek transformational development in our world. Why? Because we see in those commitments the mission of the triune God. And so we are trying to be faithful to the mission that we've received uh, from Scripture and the church in its tradition and really the promptings of the Holy Spirit to respond to our world in the ways that we see, uh, see the God of all creation responding. And so that's exciting to me. And we, we focus those efforts, uh, those ways of being or living out the gospel, really in three contexts. The context of global poverty and global migration and the global church. And one of the powerful things about Janae's uh, testimony and her work uh, that I've been able to actually visit and see firsthand 
is the way that she's helped cultivate a, a global church in Belgium, an Arabic speaking church, um, which is passionately in love with the gospel uh, and sharing it with people who haven't had access to the gospel before. And so I'm really excited that she's here with us, but I wanna add a couple of other elements that I usually don't talk about. Um, besides our approach in terms of our philosophical approach to mission, uh, one of the things that's distinctive about CBF's expression of global mission or our approach um, is our funding model actually. Um, some of you may remember, but most of you probably won't, um, that about three or four years ago, CBF adopted a new model. And so I want to be very clear with you about what gifts to the offering for global missions uh, actually do. Um, we divide our funding model into two different uh, portions or divisions. There's mission uh, presence on the one hand and mission programming on the other. And the offering for global missions supports that first, uh, that first leg of our funding model, mission presence. Well, what's that mean? It literally means everything, the, the offering for global missions covers everything that supports our field personnel's presence in the field. So they don't have to run home every other month when they look at their bank account and they see, oh my goodness, I'm running out of funds and I've got to leave the field, pull out of the mission and the ministry that I'm engaged in on a daily basis and, and go to try drum support uh, up for that. Uh, I can tell you stories in mission history. This is a very, very common experience um, from a couple of centuries ago down through the present. Um, and so the offerings for global missions, uh, your gifts to that, the church's gifts to that, what they do is they provide the salary and benefits for someone like Janae so that she doesn't have to worry, uh, am I going to be able to feed my family next month? Um, we cover their housing. They don't have to worry, is there going to be a roof over their head next month? Um, it also covers their children's educational expenses. If you happen to live in a place where the public school options aren't, uh, aren't sufficient um, or they're inadequate in some way, or perhaps the language is a barrier, um, or maybe there's not even a school in a place, um, then the offering for global missions also covers a provision to take care of our missionary kids or our third culture kids as they're called now. And so um, the presence of our field personnel are, is really crucial to doing faithful work in the world. If they're unstable, uh, then the work suffers. And so we're really grateful for the offering for global missions that can provide that sort of stability and accountability um, to our churches. Um, the other area, uh, mission programming, is raised on what we call a friends and family plan sometimes. It's raised by people like Janae by reaching out to people in their networks or to individuals they've met in churches or perhaps a Sunday school class or a missions committee here and there but its focus is really on their own networks and it invites people to give specifically to their programming. Um, we think that this is a very, very faithful and innovative way to honor both our Baptist tradition of cooperative mission giving that provides stability and accountability, but also allows our field personnel to reach out and touch people um, in a very powerful way, compelling way around their particular ministry. And so uh, that combination I believe is a wonderful recipe for moving to the future. And we arrived at that through a, a very broad process uh, of engaging field personnel, our missions council, uh, our state and regional organizations and other stakeholders here a few years back. So I'm very excited about our model and all of your gifts, 100% of your gifts to the offering for global missions provide for that mission presence. So we're excited uh, to be able to share that way. I will conclude uh, with one more minute that Ellen's given me in this section uh, to say there have been major shifts in global missions funding across the American church in the last decade or two. Um, with the rise of short-term mission experiences, many churches dramatically reallocated their mission giving uh, to support experiences uh, for their own members. Um, often, in participation with field personnel serving somewhere on the ground, unfortunately, we moved that funding away from the long-term presence of field personnel. And I wanna challenge us as a fellowship, as churches to remember uh, our short-term experiences um, uh, augment and support the long-term work 
and cross-cultural friendships that are made possible by people like Janae and others who give their lives uh, to serve and learn languages and culture and build relationships and networks to maximize the impact of short-term uh, experiences that we have in the church. Without them, our witness and our impact dramatically diminish. So I wanna make a ploy, or sorry, I guess ploy is the wrong way, a plea uh, for strong support um, to return that support to long-term mission giving that lays the foundation of all our work. And with that, I'll turn it over back to Ellen. Great. Thank you so much, Stephen. And yes, one of the other ways that we have uh, a great partnership capacity is through our Encourager Church program. Uh, and Janae can uh, talk about the benefits of that in the uh, presence for um, for her ministry there, as you, you had mentioned about raising uh, financial support for your ministry funds. Um, our Encourager Church program continues to grow and is just really a delightful way for congregations to partner in with our field personnel unit. Uh, during that process, it's a covenant signing uh, with a term limit on there that's renewable, of course, uh, through, uh, through the church and through our field personnel. But it's a really really great way for a church to get to know the work of a specific field personnel unit and um, to also offer prayer support as well as the financial support. It's also a way to deepen that relationship with field presence uh, for the church to actually be on mission with, with our field personnel. And it's just really a, um, it's a really family concept uh, with the Encourage a Church ministry that brings it together. And tonight on our community gathering, um, you'll hear about one of those. Uh, at our seven o'clock community gathering that if you can't watch it tonight, you can watch the recorded piece of it as well. Uh, but Jennifer Gendrick from First Carrollton, uh, will talk a little bit about their Encourager Church connection uh, with the parks. So if you want more information about that, please look on our website um, at cbf.net slash encourager dash church or contact me directly. Uh, we're going to move on to Xiao Chen to uh, lead us through some of our Offering for Global Mission endeavors for this current time and to hear a little bit more about your own story and about the way field personnel uh, or missionaries influenced your life. So Xiao Chen, thank you for coming. Thank you, Ellen. It's great to be with all of you today. And um, I wanted to spend this time basically to um, highlight some of the resources that um, we're offering. Um, I think this is uh, so important. And while I cannot go over every single uh, resource, I want to do a, a few highlights, especially the new resources um, that we've come up with for this, uh, for this year's 2020 OGM uh, campaign. And uh, one of the things I think that's really important is for all of you to know that all these resources are housed in one place. And all you have to remember is cbf.net forward slash OGM, that's cbf.net slash OGM. And you will find the entire suite of resources here in this one place. And the good news is uh, almost everything here is downloadable um, and they are at absolutely no cost uh, to, uh, to be downloaded and they can be used immediately. So they're all downloadable and uh, there's lots of great resources that can, that, that can be used immediately with the downloads. Uh, the first resource that I want to highlight is, um, as I walk through uh, these resources, the leader's guide, I think is really important uh, to let you all know that uh, this leader's guide is a handy guidebook for anyone in the church who will be leading this uh, missions uh, OGM giving campaign. And the leader's guide provide very hands-on, practical, simple um, tools and advice on how to do a successful campaign from as simple as setting a date and a goal for your offering. And it also guides you through those resources that you can use uh, each um, each during each step of your, of your campaign. So I encourage any leaders of the church to, um, to download this guide. It's only four pages and I promise you it is not overwhelming. It's uh, very condensed and very user-friendly. So I encourage you to, um, to do that, the leader's guide. The second thing I wanna uh, highlight is the seasonal offering uh, bulletin insert. 
Um, and uh, there are two, there is the winter, fall winter focus, which uh, features uh, Janae Angel's uh, ministry in Belgium and the spring focus, which is on the Zivanovs in uh, work in St. Louis. So there are two uh, very specific uh, seasonal inserts uh, that you can use for your bulletin in order to highlight uh, the work of uh, uh, Jenny Angel and also the Ziv uh, Zivanovs. And uh, there are worship resources that can accompany uh, the bulletin. In fact, there are fact sheets available for each of the field personnel uh, that's being um, highlighted. So I encourage you to download those fact sheets to educate your congregation on uh, the, uh, the field personnel and to really help them make a connection to the story, uh, the faces and the lives of these field personnel. And in the worship resources, there are children's prayer and sermons, which would be a wonderful way for your any of your family ministers or children's minister to be able to use uh, to include the children in worship and also responsive readings uh, for your worship as it relates uh, to the work of these field personnel. So I encourage you to look at those worship resources. And this year we do have a customizable postcard uh, some of you who want your um, church members to receive something in the mail, this is a postcard that you can customize and download. And uh, you can print it yourself uh, in, in the church or you can send it to a local printer to have it printed and have it mailed out to individual congregation members. And uh, Bible studies is um, back this year, which is a great way to engage your congregation is to do um, uh, a few Bible study sessions with both for your adults, uh, youth, and even children, where uh, these Bible studies focus on the themes of um, hospitality and justice for the adults and the youth. And for the children, it's specific to Janae Angel's work and also the Zivanovs. So I encourage you to use these Bible studies as a way to engage your congregation even deeper in, um, in, the, in the work of the, our field personnel. And they're all downloadable too. So it's, it's instant. You can get it. And if you are preparing for Sunday school on Sunday, you can download it on Saturday, study it and be able to present it. Because we know that we are in this pandemic times and uh, most of our, many of our worship services are still online and digital, we are, uh, we have provided PowerPoint slides as part of the resource. Um, which is another important piece to highlight, especially for pastors and ministers who are leading in worship. You have uh, ready-made PowerPoint slides that are downloadable uh, here, both for standard and widescreen. So keep that in mind. And uh, this is ideal for your Zoom worship. And then last but not least, the OGM videos are excellent and I encourage you, this is another easy way uh, to really engage your congregation. Each video is under three minutes. In fact, it's average about two minutes, not long at all that you can easily include within your uh, worship service to show the congregation uh, even via Zoom on, uh, there is an overview video for each of those field personnel and uh, accompanied by three to four impact stories for each of their work. And I can tell you that I, um, I've watched every single one of those videos and they are truly powerful. They tell the story and uh, they connect with the heart and um, you, you hear people, real life people who are being impacted by the work of our field personnel and how their lives are being transformed as a result of their work. And I think these videos offer such a powerful way of helping your uh, congregation members to realize that the money that they're giving is, uh, you know, this is not just um, sort of a mundane act of giving, but this is a holy uh, practice and discipline of giving because Jesus can use the gifts that we give 
and multiply it and be able to uh, transform the lives of people here in the United States and across the world. So I encourage you to really use those videos um, within your worship services. And uh, last but not least, uh, a number of the OGM resources can also be ordered. So plan ahead. Um, feel free to submit those order forms that are also on that website, on that page. Anything that's not downloadable, such as the prayer guide, can be ordered. Um, so feel free to make those orders and we will be sure to send them off to, to you and your churches um, for you to use. Um, let's see. Last but not least, I do want to emphasize uh, what Stephen Porter had already said, which is that 100% of the gifts that you give to OGM supports the long-term presence of our field personnel wherever they've been called by God to serve. And this is so important. And um, I want to speak a little bit about why that is so important. Um, part of my faith journey, I, I came to faith as a result of the work of uh, missionaries in Singapore. And to be honest with you, if it were not for their long-term presence, which is building relationships with me, uh, relationship with me and the investment of time and, and energy um, and the trust that's, that can only be built uh, over a long period of time. Uh, as a result of their long-term presence, um, I came to, uh, to know uh, Christ because of their work. And, uh, and also they offered, uh, they were able to provide the discipleship for me that continued to nurture my faith. And, um, and I am where I am today, really, at CBF. It's, it's um, serendipitous in that sense where it's full circle for me being able to serve the very organization that is sending out field, continues to send out field personnel. Because let me tell you, the good news is still good news. And the good news is ever more so still good news, especially in the times that we live in. And it's unbelievable as you watch those impact stories uh, that we have to hear the stories of lives that are changed because I certainly can speak to that. And um, I just wanna really um, help all the churches understand how important that is even today. Um, so I think I'm, uh, I have done the overview and uh, Alan, I'll give it back to you uh, to continue on Great. the program. Great. Thank you so much, Xiao Qian. Those were extremely helpful uh, for all of us. And uh, I am really, really proud of the resources that, uh, that our development department and communications have put together. Um, the, hopefully you received your offering for global missions packet. You know, we constantly refer to OGM. So just in case you're not familiar with those letters, the offering for global missions. If you haven't received that packet and won't, um, want to get one, if you will just type your information into the um, comment line, we'll be glad to do that. Or you can send an email to me and uh, I'll make sure that you, uh, that you get one as soon as possible. I had mentioned earlier about our Encourage Your Church program and uh, Janae, I looked quickly over on Facebook and saw one of your Encourage Your Churches is on, Second Pond, so Heather Webb is on, so you might want to wave, give, we'll give a shout out to Heather um, as she's watching and, and listening. But Janae, we welcome you. Thank you for joining us from Belgium today. And uh, tell us a little bit about your family and um, about your work there and your long-term presence. And on behalf of all of us, we say thank you for that. We appreciate uh, your work and uh, what you do. So welcome. Well, thank you, Ellen. And thank you for um, inviting me to be a part of the conversation. Um, yeah, so I am the field personnel with CBS, but my husband, Hari, and I work together as a unit, as you can imagine. Um, He's the Syrian Arabic speaker. I'm not so good at Arabic, so that helps that he can speak the language. We do have a lot of languages in our house, though. Um, I speak English with the girls. Hari and I met in Brussels, so we speak French together. And then we live in the largest Dutch-speaking city in the country, so we speak Dutch as well. And then Hari has Arabic and Aramaic. So we have a combination of five languages between the four of us. Uh, so it can get kind of messy and confusing at times. And we've learned the art of speaking four languages in one sentence. So we have our own, ah, our own personal language. Can you still hear me? Is that good? Okay. 
All right. So uh, we work with Arabic speakers, so probably people coming mostly out of um, the Middle East right now, especially with the war in Syria that's gone on and conflicts in Iraq. But we also work with North Africaners, like from Morocco or Egypt. And we work with the, the refugees that are coming out, but certainly everyone is an immigrant here in Belgium that we work with. And so there's lots of different needs and our focus is on church planting and just taking care of those refugees that come in and need just help in so many different ways. Uh, we started our second church plant in Antwerp less than two years ago with a ministry house that we were able to buy. And so um, God has worked out so many things that we could not have expected or imagined through faithful givers and partner churches and people all over providing for ministry here. Uh, so, but when we work with refugees, we do all kinds of things like um, the job changes to what their needs are. I might be setting up an electric account with the electric company for somebody so they can have heat in the winter. Uh, I might be showing somewhere where, someone where the supermarket is or going to the doctor or the lawyer. You know, it just depends on what their immediate needs are, but they don't normally have Dutch speaking ability. So we have to work with a lot of different languages. So I'm on contact with social workers and all kinds of legal professionals for all the refugees that come in. Everybody has my email, I think, in the entire country by now, it feels like. Uh, so that, that job um, is not steady, but it's fluid and it goes with the needs of people so that we can give the cup of water in the name of Jesus. Uh, so whatever the water looks like that day is what we're busy doing. Um, so the work is continual, ongoing. Then, of course, church ministry and church planting looks probably a lot like um, a normal Sunday service. Obviously not in COVID. We're all on Zoom, as you all are probably as well. Um, but then we have prayer meetings and Bible studies that go on and one-on-one -on -one discipleship. And I meet with the women and just kind of keep in contact with people. Right now, WhatsApp is our app that we use. And so... Um, the job, like I said, looks different every day and certainly looks different during the season of COVID than it did even before. But we're hoping that one day we will return to not have this lockdown that we are experiencing right now in Belgium. And we can return to face-to-face -face ministry and not have so many rules and regulations over us. But I personally have been in Belgium for 17 years. I started off in Brussels as an English teacher with TBS as a gsb -er back in the day. Global Service Force, um, and I came here on a two to three year contract. I signed up for three years, um, and at the end of the three years, my missionary team said, hey, wouldn't you like to stay on longer? And I said, okay, sure, let me pray about that, and God seemed to say yes. And so <laughs> after that, uh, Hari and I got married 12 years ago, and that kind of solidified my presence here in Belgium because I can't take the Syrian to America and I'm not going to Syria right now. So um, we are here in Belgium. And about 10 years ago, Phoebe was just a five month old baby. We felt like the Lord was saying, I want you out of Brussels because the only two Arabic speaking churches were actually in the Brussels region. So it didn't make sense that we stay and add the third one, but go to where none had been planted. And so God called us out of Brussels and into Antwerp. Um, and so I personally have seen many seasons of CBS and transitions in CBS over the last 17 years. I starting out as the GS peer, and then I moved into the affiliate role. And now um, I'm field personnel with the support and benefit of the offering for global missions. So when that transition happened three years ago, the, the, the benefits, the blessing of the offering for global mission was huge for our family. Because three years ago, before three years ago, I was teaching English um, as a part, very part-time job to help support Hari's family stranded in Egypt out of the war in Syria. Hari was working full-time as a welder um, and then do, we were doing ministry after hours, uh, Hari working 40 hours as a welder and then working 30 hours on weekends and evenings. There were so many days that we literally saw each other for five or 10 minutes in passing. Um, the girls got used to the doorbell ringing and just 
didn't even question it. Bye, Baba. See you later. We just know that Baba's going and he's going to do something for Jesus, but we don't see him. So when when I came on as field personnel and, and received the support and blessing and the offering for Global Missions, that changed our family and it changed our ministry. Because for the first time, my job ended as an English teacher and Hari was able to ask to go to part-time at his welding job so that he could concentrate those 30 hours of ministry in a different way so that we could actually see each other. And we live in glass houses as missionaries. Everybody's watching how our family works and operates. And so just the idea of us being together, children seeing their father, husband and wife seeing each other um, for more than five minutes a day, increased our ministry and how we were able to share the gospel with people because we talk about the importance of marriage and family but if we're not using that as a priority in our own lives it's hard for people to listen to how god wants the marriage and family to work so we have received so much of a blessing in our own lives and in our ministry because of the offerings for global missions it's just changed the way we are able to live and do ministry and so um i just I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for Encourage Your Churches. And I love the fact that we can have more than one because I felt like I was on an island all by myself for years as an affiliate. So then to have people who say, but we want to encourage you. We want to be there for you. We want to check in. And um, my, my father died this summer and I was able to be there for the last three weeks of his life. And the outpouring of support because I was on sick leave to go and take home or take care of him at home um, and had to bring the girls with me. So the three of us in the middle of COVID, in the middle of all of this, um, just the outpouring of people who said, we love you so much that we just want to help you take care of these flights. We want to, um, Heather was great at just sending my girls toys because we didn't have room in our luggage pack toys and so we have magnetic blocks and all kinds of paper fun um that just people loved on us i know through prayer through financial help and through gifts like toys and just fun things along the way that just blessed us and made that that difficult summer just a little bit easier and so we're grateful for everything this offers to encourage the churches and offerings for schools and missions. Great. Thank you so much. Jeanette. Those are important words for all of us to hear and to be reminded of often because we uh, we go back to that phrase. It takes a village and it takes a village to not only raise a child, but to to uh, to see each other through some of the storms of life. Um, we covet those prayers and the prayer support that we get. And uh, of course, we are grateful for all the financial dollars that come for our offering for global missions that help the sustainability and the long term presence for our field personnel. And and for the, the regular giving to CBF that allows us to be a part of that as, as CBF staff as well. So thank you. Thank you for those words. And thank you for the uh, encouragement that you bring to us and the good that you do, uh, not just in Belgium, but around the world, because the seeds that you have planted in, in many people um, have taken it back to other places. So we are, are grateful for that in your long term presence. Stephen, I think you have a couple of questions for us. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Ellen and, and Janae, especially uh, for sharing some of your story. Again, I wish everybody could come with me sometime and visit you, uh, though your house doesn't have quite enough space for a, a lot of us to do that. Uh, it's very tall and narrow. <laughs> and so uh, uh, I, I want to ask kind of in a little bit of a moderated panel discussion, uh, but I have particular questions for each person. I actually want to start with Ellen because um, uh, we, she serves as host, but she has such a rich wealth of experiences related to support for mission and engaging the local church in mission and leading uh, out in that way that I, I don't want to, uh, uh, to miss her voice in this. And Ellen, uh, I want to ask you is in your experience as a minister in a local church for many years, um, what difference did giving to support global missions make in the life of your local church and then also in the lives of individuals? Uh, because often I think we focus so much on the impact that it makes out in the field that we forget sometimes the impact that uh, giving has actually on our own lives. And so could you talk about that a little bit? 
Sure. Thank you. Yeah, we uh, I served at a local congregation for 27 years in South Carolina. And um, to see the transformation that our own congregation had uh, because of our not just our giving to missions, but also our participation in missions uh, that really transforms you as as a Christian, but as a minister um, too. And when the congregation is bought into a lot of that, it transforms the church from being just a one off on missions uh, occasionally kind of thing, but to really being on mission on the all the time. Uh, the congregation, the church had a long history of great mission involvement. And uh, we started our children out in, in our preschool program uh, with missions um, and bringing things. And our field personnel uh, would come to us for them um, oftentimes. And then as first or fifth graders, they got to go out and do some mission work within the community and around. But there again, we would invite field personnel to come to them. Um, and then once you got into the youth program, you got to go on missions, you know, the bigger mission uh, trips and stuff. So we created kind of a, uh, a, a lifetime expectation of what you got to do. And then as a high school student, every three years, um, we went to Romania to Project Ruth, where we um, have had field personnel in the past, but as one of our legacy partners here at CBF. And so seeing the transformation within ourselves of what happens when we partner in with field personnel. And as we um, not just talk about missions, but actually do missions and be a part of missions becomes second nature for many of us. And so the giving, uh, the financial giving for missions uh, became kind of an easy piece sometimes because mm -hmm. when we invited field personnel to come to church um, to speak on, on behalf of missions and, and their work, there was never a time uh, that that happened that immediately after you know, what can we do for them? How can we participate? How can we uh, partner? Because we really looked for long-term presence. Um, we we did a big church study years prior um, to, we did a big church study prior to, uh, to some of that giving and it was about toxic charity. And so we had to really look at the things that we were doing and if those were um, more beneficial for us or were they more beneficial for the community and uh, were they creating long-term partnerships for us? So our offering mm -hmm. uh, for not just global missions, but our offering for CBF in general really rose um, to meet those needs. So it's, it's well, important work. Um, the book Ellen referenced then toxic charity is written by Bob Lupton. And I would encourage you uh, urban minister here in, in Atlanta, actually, I'd, I'd encourage you to, uh, to look it up. It's worth, worth your time. Um, Ellen, as you were talking, it reminded me when I served in Miami at Touching Miami with Love, um, we had a, a, we didn't call it encourager church back then, but we had a, a covenantal partnership with a church in rural Kentucky, which over five years, 90% of that small rural church came to Miami, which uh, felt like a foreign mission trip, I suspect, for, for, for most of, of the members. And they were so deeply engaged and they gave financially. Um, uh, you know, it was an enormous amount, but they gave sacrificially and everyone was deeply engaged from, you know, I remember one year, the third grade boys Sunday school class, uh, uh, made, uh, I think it was like 300, uh, uh, toiletry kits for homeless folks that they put in socks and they sent to us for Christmas. Um, and they, they, uh, you know, raised, uh, uh, goods and support from everyone in their entire school and their neighborhoods and everything like that. And over the time, um, that church, it energized the church in such ways that it, it was really interesting. The pastor once said, we are, we are launching and actually based on the energy and the momentum from this experience of this partnership, uh, we've uh, created a, a development campaign uh, to create a family life center. Uh, and to build a, a building to, to minister to their community more effectively. Uh, and they trace that all to the energy that came out of their giving and partnership and mission, which was really an interesting thing. It wasn't that they, you know, they endowed a, a new wing at, the, at Touching My With Love, it, but that energy couldn't be contained. It had to spill over into the world and their ministry to their community. I just thought that was a beautiful thing. Um, so I wanna ask uh, Xiao Chen to talk a little bit um, perhaps more specifically, um, could you share a few tips for, for how to, to lead a really successful 
uh, Offering for Global Missions giving campaign in your local church? Sure, thank you, Stephen. Yeah, I'm uh, happy to share. And uh, one thing about any kind of fundraising is that there's no magic necessarily to it. <laughs> uh, there are, however, uh, best practices, if you want to call it, or just uh, steps that uh, one should take and that can uh, in increase your chances of uh, a successful campaign. So first and foremost, I would encourage um, all churches really to, to set a goal, to set a goal when it comes to um, the OGM uh, offering. L look at, it's always good at look, looking at the numbers from last year, for example, look at how much your church raised uh, last year. And then I would um, always strive to at least do a goal that is 10% uh, more than uh, what was raised last year. So that, you know, the, the importance of that is really getting, getting all of us in a habit of, you know, knowing that there's a goal and knowing that each year we're going to do better, that we're going to try mm -hmm. um, to increase our uh, level of giving, our level of engagement and involvement in, in supporting um, uh, global missions. So first and foremost, always set a goal. That's very basic, but very, very important. And um, second is the idea of repetition. Repetition is good, mm -hmm. right? When you start, let's say, usually uh, in the fall, we start the OGM campaign, the offering, and uh, you begin it, uh, you begin to introduce it during a worship service and your newsletter, but make sure that it's not just a one-time mention. So you wanna try to spread it out and once a week, at least have one mention of uh, the OGM offering. And um, you can use your newsletter, uh, you can use your social media platform, you can use an e-blast. Uh, however your churches communicate with one another, uh, the digital, your digital newsletter, your website, uh, think about all those different platforms of communication to communicate the offering to your members. And one of the good thing about um, this pandemic time is that we have become a lot more creative, sort of we've been forced to be creative about how we stay in touch, how we communicate. So use that to your advantage to um, increase people's uh, awareness of the offering and which will also increase the likelihood of them giving over time. So make sure that you plan out the, this uh, repetition of communication and messaging over a period of time. And Shaka, then, as, yes. As you said that, it just does strike me that your social media point is so good. Those short videos are designed to be able to, to pop right. out in that way. Yep. So it gives your church content that you wouldn't otherwise have, and it's so easy to do. So thanks for mentioning that in particular. Uh, you're definitely most welcome. And also use the resources, all the social media posts. Uh, it's there in the resources on the website uh, for your newsletter. Uh, everything is, we try to make it as easy as possible for you to communicate about the OGM offering through all these different platforms. So again, there's the screen for all the OGM resources for your church. We have logos, we have pictures, all available for you. OGM photos right there that you can use. And all the logos are social media friendly. Um, so you can use all those things and the videos that you can insert in uh, the social media and even your website. So I encourage you to, to use all these resources as a form to communicate to your congregation about the offering to global missions. And then track your goals. Track your goal, very important track them and communicate them often to your congregation. You know, where are we? Let's say if your goal is 5,000, where are we this week? And, and be creative, right? Uh, use the uh, Hebrews 13, two is the uh, Bible verse that is the focus for this OGM offering. And Hebrews 13, two says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Hebrews 13, two, be creative. Use that verse as a way to track your uh, goals. Use, uh, for example, an image of a round table with uh, different, with chairs around it. And each chair can represent a, uh, a dollar amount. Let's say each chair is $100 or $500. And every time you 
uh, you've reached the $500 mark, you put a chair in the table until the whole table is filled. You know, the idea of hospitality, a round table, a welcoming presence, um, use uh, images like the uh, loaves and fish, right? How Jesus multiplied, uh, can multiply Omega offering. Each loaf can represent that $100, so that $500 mark. And how many loaves and fish do we need to get to our 5,000? Use those visuals to create something uh, really exciting uh, to show your congregation that we are two fish away, two loaves away, or two chairs away from completing this table. So there are just multiple ways to really be creative about tracking your goals. I think and, uh, Ellen was thinking about an angel thermometer oh, angel on the stage. <laughs> yeah, it, it's that awesome. That too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Or, or, or maybe a, or maybe, or just maybe a portrait of Stephen. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll vote for the angel. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. So also like. Um, maybe a virtual Christmas tree where there are ornaments that you can put on like a globe, each globe representing a certain amount or both an ornament of an angel or an ornament of a globe. You can combine all those things. And every time you reach the goal, you'll be able to put an ornament on the Christmas tree, on the virtual Christmas tree. So there's just really fun ways to engage your congregation, including the children to get them all excited about it. Um, as the children learn about it in Bible study, they can then see visually during the worship service on how the church is really doing this together as a community and how they're trying to reach their goals. And you can even engage your youth and your children in getting people excited about the offering. Um, Thank you for that. I wanna ask Janae one more question, but I'm, I'm gonna make two other observations. Um, historically, one of the greatest indicators of increases in giving to the offering for global missions has been when churches have invited field personnel to speak. Mm -hmm. And this is easier than ever. You don't have to pay to fly Janae over from Belgium or whoever from wherever. Um, because of this moment of pandemic, we have all become much more facile with technology and you can have people do a, a, from a full sermon to a short missions moment, and make a plug for uh, people on the other side of, of the world. And it's very, very easy. So um, please don't hesitate to invite field personnel or even staff. And I'll even offer Paul Baxley for this, uh, our executive coordinator. We're all happy uh, to be present to you in your churches. And the second thing I would say just from, from my own church, one thing that we noticed in this virtual moment is that we need to be much more intentionally clear about the mechanism for giving. In my church, normally we would have had offering envelopes in a pew and people would uh, give to that and we'd collect those. Um, and I think we didn't do that quite as well. It wasn't so clear exactly how do we give. We talked very consistently about the offering, um, but the actual mechanism for how do you give, uh, we need to be really clear with our churches about that because uh, you could give them a link to go directly to OGM, or do you give it through the congregation? But we just need to be clear about that in this strange moment that we are now occupying with pandemic. That's that's something that um, you can't take for granted is something I think I learned uh, over the past month at our own church. So Janae, I'm going to give you the last kind of question. And that's simply this, um, you know, in Luke's gospel, um, how uh, people use their wealth and possessions is an indication of their, or a test of their discipleship to Jesus. And I am curious, uh, as we are the richest nation in history, um, how does giving to God's mission, uh, I'm sorry, I kind of collapsed a couple of things, but I am curious how, how in your experience, um, people, Arabic speakers, uh, there in Belgium who have come from different countries, um, even Belgian Christians in Antwerp. Um, how does our giving here, um, what does that mean to them in their lives? Um, are they conscious of the way that ministry is made possible because of churches back here giving sacrificially, using our, our possessions as a mark of our discipleship here? How does that impact people there? Well, certainly our people are aware of um, the support, whether it be through finances or prayer, the support that's happening from the other side of the ocean. Um, one of 
one of the things that's just happened in the last year and a half is that we were able to have a place where people can meet. And so they were very aware of support from other people outside of themselves. I said before that we minister to immigrants and refugees. And so I count the offering every week <laughs> and it, it resembles the offering of the widow's might. You know that they're giving out of their heart and what they have, but it's not going to be enough to pay an electric bill. It's not going to be enough uh, to do ministry in the way that probably we as Westerners think of ministry. It's not going to be a way in, in their culture through hospitality to meet the needs of those who are really in need. And so it's, it's knowing that we are in this together, that we are, we are leaning on the financial giving and support of those who are able to do that. And we are also leaning into the Arabs and their way to communicate Jesus with their language and through their resources that might not be financial. And so we are very aware that it's a partnership to do this work together, that we can't do it alone. Whether it is finances or it is prayer, we can't do it alone. We're all in this together. And so um, we are all very aware and very thankful that we are, we are building the kingdom together and the kingdom is global. And so I love that beautiful picture because heaven's going to be filled with multiple colors and languages. And, and so we feel that sense of the kingdom here on earth whenever those, those resources combine. Yeah. Thank you, Janae. Thank you, Xiao Chen and, and Steve, and particularly the three of you for helping us have this important conversation. And uh, and Janae for the firsthand accounts of of your work and and the benefits that um, that the offering for global mission provide there. And Xiao Chen for your personal experience. Uh, for your raising in Singapore and meeting uh, the caps and uh, the way field personnel um, have, have not only touched the lives of many, but specifically yours and has brought you to this place this day. So it's a, it's really interesting. And now your husband even pastors a CBF church. So it's really a, it, it's a, it's a whole story. Uh, uh, many, many pieces. Uh, I love the imagery of the quilt and all the many pieces um, that it takes to make that a whole piece um, as well. And that it blankets us as that constant reminder of the faith in Christ that we have and that we share. And it's not ours alone, that it comes from many multiple pieces. Um, but thank you all for joining in this conversation today and want to give a shout out to some of our other field personnel that are present um, uh, listening and encouraging us today. So I know that Sam Harrell and Stephanie Vance and Nell Green are on Facebook as well watching and cheering us on because I've gotten some sassy comments occasionally and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like them. I like them. It keeps, it keeps us real. Uh, but again, our, um, our ability to speak in your congregations and to not just talk about the offering for global missions, but to talk about missions in general or to preach or to bring a mission moment to share a mission highlight. Uh, we're all available for that. We are re energizing our speakers bureau and you'll be hearing more about that in December. Uh, our field personnel and staff are eager to be in your congregation um, and eager to share the great work of CBF. Um, I know that Xiao Chen is eager to get in your church as well and to help you figure out some of the, some new funding for you, raises ways for your own congregation to raise money, um, as well as your continued giving to CBF. So thank you all for the, the support that you've given today. And we thank our audience for participating. And if you know some other churches that are, um, that would be encouraged by this conversation, feel free to share the link. It'll be up later this week on cbf.net. On our homepage, you'll see a thing about CBF conversations and you just click there and it'll take you right to the library of, of all of our other CBF conversations that we've had in the last three months. Uh, many of those are in advocacy as well as uh, global missions and uh, some other areas as well. But again, thank you. We thank you for all your attention today and a big shout out to Wes Browning and uh, his help to assist us with this, but also to Carrie Harris and the rest of the communications department for helping uh, make this happen for us today. So we appreciate you and we look forward to seeing you later. Um, and don't hesitate to reach out if you need some OGM material, if you need a speaker, or if you want to be an encourager church. I have a medallion waiting for you <laughs> in your congregation. <laughs> so again, thank you.